I was sitting with the head mortician having a cup of coffee when one of the staff informed us that a new one had come in. I had already been doing the job for a few weeks, but wasn't prepared for what I was about to see. It turns out that this new one had died in a logging accident. I was pretty sure it wasn't the chainsaw that had done the damage, but the fact that he'd been squashed under a tree. The mortician and I just looked at the body for a while, a sight that hardly looked human anymore. The man's head had pretty much burst, and what was really shocking was that the skin on his face was still kind of in one piece, but not really connected to anything. How could we possibly fix this guy? You're probably wondering how anyone lands a job like that. Well, I guess you're more concerned with the issue of why anyone would want to do this as a job. The answer is pretty simple, and that's just the fact that someone has to do it, and they have to do it well. Sure, I've been queasy in the past when looking at bodies, I've felt sad when what I saw before me were children's <laughs> bodies, but in the end we have a job to do, and we are an indispensable service to the people of the USA. I got the job after I saw an opening for a mortician's assistant while I was studying anatomy, and that's how I ended up trying to put back together a man that had been almost obliterated by a very heavy tree. Before I get into the nitty gritty, or should I say the gorier aspects of the job, I'd like to get a few things straight first. Don't worry, I'll get around to the most harrowing things I've seen, but you guys need to know the finer details first. Okay, so you, me, your parents, the president, the newborn next door, and every other living person on the planet will eventually die. Check out. Kick the bucket. Give up the ghost. Sorry to tell you that, but it's a fact. As one of my favorite rock bands once said, do you realize that everyone you know someday will die? Let's see who will get that reference in the comment section. It's very likely that when you expire, an autopsy won't be performed on you by a pathologist. Not many people will have a pathologist open them up and a medical examiner later state the likely cause of death. This happens to very few people, and it's usually because the cause of death is unknown or something looks suspicious. Here's an example. I know a case of an investigative journalist who apparently drowned in a swimming pool while investigating corruption in a very corrupt country. His death was quickly ruled accidental drowning, but when his parents demanded an autopsy it turned out that part of the guy's tongue was missing and he had a severe subdural hematoma that's torn blood vessels on the surface of the brain. He'd actually been beaten to death, then thrown in a pool. As I said, this was in a very corrupt country where the cops are often seen as mafia. Before I get to my mortician stories and how we put bodies back together to make them presentable for family and friends of the deceased, let me quickly tell you what happens during an autopsy. I'll try to keep this short. Let's imagine you've died and your death seems suspicious. Maybe one minute you were fine and healthy just watching an episode of the infographic show and then the next minute you were found dead in your bed. You had no serious medical conditions and there were no obvious signs as to why you died. Ok, so your body is then going to be taken to an examiner's room and there's a pathologist and his or her assistant and they're going to work on you. They're going to make what's called a Y incision. That's a Y shape starting from your shoulders that meets at the chest and then goes down to the pubic area. You've likely seen this next part in a horror movie and this entails cracking the ribs and, for want of a better expression, opening you up. Now your organs are exposed, and the next step is to make a series of cuts to sever certain parts of you that are all connected under the hood. That means disconnecting organs attached to the spinal cord, and basically it's just a lot of snipping around. Once the snipping is done, the pathologist will then remove your organs and you'll just be a shell of your former self. That head of yours will of course still be in tip-top condition seeing as you were found undamaged on the outside, but the pathologist is gonna want your brain. He's gonna kinda scalp you cutting from one ear across your forehead to the other ear and around, and that cut's divided in two parts, and those parts of the scalp will be pulled from the skull. Yep, sounds a bit like peeling a fruit. And if you think I shouldn't say that, well let me tell you that people who've been doing this a very long time are pretty unaffected by what would make most ordinary folks faint or throw up. There was a time I was one of those guys. So that front flap goes over your face and the back flap down toward your neck. Now it's time to get the saw out and cut a cap in the skull, and hey presto, your brain is now exposed. By the way, when that cap comes off, it makes a kind of popping sound. Let's not forget that your brain is connected to the spinal cord, so that connection has to be severed. Once that's done, you can take it out like you would open a rambutan fruit. What's taken out will now be analyzed, and that's not something I'll get into because it's way too technical for today's show, and to be honest, I'm more of a cleanup guy than a pathologist. 
I can tell you that the organs will be weighed because their weight might point to the cause of death. Your stomach contents will be examined, as will your eye, fluid, bile, urine, and liver tissue. And on top of that, blood tests will be done. How did you die, you might wonder? The report said it was an overdose of information, which is quite common in this day and age. After your organs have been analyzed and the medical examiner said what the cause of death is, those organs could take a number of journeys. They might just be disposed of, or they might be preserved, or they might get put back in you. The problem now is that this mess on the table that looks like a man who has suffered a reverse Viking blood eagle punishment is far from the good-looking fellow he used to be. You need to be put back together. We sometimes call this reconstituting the body. When things are back in place, your body will be stitched up with baseball stitches. We call them that because they look like rather large stitches on a baseball. That skull cap that was taken off will be put back on the cranium and the scalp will also be sewn back together. And you're as good as new, if not dead as a dodo. Someone then gets on the phone and says, hey Mr. Mortician, time for you to get to work. Like I said, not many bodies will have to come off an autopsy table. Unfortunately, some bodies are pretty much beyond repair. They've decomposed so badly that there's nothing we can do to make them more presentable. That would be like trying to turn your scrambled eggs back into uncracked eggs. In these cases, we'll seal the body or body parts and refrigerate them. That funeral has to be quick due to the stench of decomposition. In most cases, though, we can embalm the body even if it's in a bad state. So let's say we get a body and that person has been pretty beaten up after a car crash. We'll first check the label to see who it is and after that, if there are any clothing on the body, we're going to take that off. We'll also cover the private parts. Now they'll be lying down on the table with their head elevated a little bit and it's time to clean the body. Then we're going to inspect the body such as where all the blood is settled. This is called lividity and if you've watched enough TV crime shows, you'll know that dead bodies will have purple parts where the blood is settled. We'll obviously check all vital signs because no one wants to bury a living person. Stranger things have happened, but not on my watch. I can assure you that dead bodies can groan and they can move, but that's just because gases are in the body and muscles harden during a period we call rigor mortis, when the body goes stiff. To release the gases, we can do something called a trocar, which looks a bit like a funnel. We have a word for all this moving around and we call it cadaveric spasm. You might have heard of bodies just sitting up, but that's something I've never seen and never heard of from any other professional. Okay, so we have a body and we'll massage it to kind of relieve that stiffening of the body, the rigor mortis. And we're going to now close the mouth and make sure it stays closed by sewing it or using wires. We'll also make sure the eyes are closed either by using a skin colored glue or eye caps that are skin colored. No one wants to turn up to a casket and see a gaping mouth and wide open eyes staring at them. The term is rest in peace, and so the body shouldn't look like someone who's just watched a video of a dark-haired Japanese girl getting out of a well. What we're going to do next is very important. It's our piece de resistance. We're going to find the common carotid artery and drain the blood vessels. At the same time, we'll inject embalming chemicals into the arteries. We'll use an electric pump for this, which works kind of like the heart. The blood comes out and the fluid goes in. This process is all about preserving the body. There's also cavity embalming, which first involves putting one of those trocars into the chest cavity and the abdomen and getting out all the fluids and gases. And after that, a formaldehyde-based chemical embalming mixture will be put into those cavities. If there are some places where the chemicals haven't reached, hmm. we have the option of doing something called hypodermic embalming which is just finding the right spot to inject the chemicals. You're probably thinking, what if the body's torn to shreds and the face is full of bullet holes? Well, in that case, cauterizing chemicals will be used to dry the wounds and bleach them. That won't do the trick, though, and we'll have to sew the wounds together as best as we can using a wax suture. We might also use a skin-colored glue on the wound. If there are any big holes, we can use fillers such as plaster of Paris and then color the filler with a kind of spray tan. If we've been successful, you'll never know that there'd been a hole. Some things we hmm. just can't fix. Like that logger guy, we just couldn't put the guy back together again. He was what some of us in the profession call a Humpty Dumpty. I've had a few of these men and women we couldn't put back together again, but we've had other cases where we spent many hours on restoration. Some of my friends in the business of embalming have put someone's head back on, but that was only because it was a very clean cut like one from a guillotine. But if the head is gone because the accident has basically destroyed the body, we have no chance. No one will be viewing that body. Burns can also be very problematic and a lot harder to fix than knife wounds, gunshot wounds, or jumped off a 10th floor balcony wounds because we can't give someone new skin and flesh who'd suffered terrible burns. If we've done these first parts of the job well, our next task is to use cosmetics to give the deceased a healthier look. We use creams and lotions and makeup for that. We're like artists, and if I must say so myself, I've made people look so fine that if I'd posted their new face on Tinder, they'd have been swiped right all day long. 
We even comb their hair and sometimes add a bit of gel or cream. And then, like amateur stylists, we get to work. Dead bodies aren't always the sweetest smelling things in the world, so we use powders to make them more pleasing to the olfactory sense. As for clothing, that's up to the family. Most folks go for smart business attire, but others go for certain fashions along with some bling. Obviously, if I feel like a certain body part needs to be covered, I'll say so, because as I said, we can't always work our magic when the body has taken too much of a beating. If you were there to ask me what my worst day on the job was, I would not tell you it was the sight of a destroyed body. But when the person on the table in front of me had been a high school buddy of mine, even so, I did my best to put him back together again. I attended the funeral as both a friend and the man that got him ready for his funeral. His parents came up to me and acknowledged that it must have been very hard for me to work on their son, but they also said I'd done a wonderful job and thanked me profusely. That still brings a tear to my eye, and it's why I remain a person whose days are spent around dead people. I'm no longer an assistant, I'm the man himself, the main mortician in the funeral house. The video we're going to recommend now is an oldie but a goodie, because we all want to know the answer to what happens when you die. Or perhaps you'd enjoy this other video instead.